Remember, no matter how good you treat this body, a 150 pound man's only worth 84 cents. That's right, but you got a soul worth 10,000 worlds. You'll take care of that 84 cents and that 10,000 worlds for anyway. Check out. Welcome to the 10,000 Worlds Podcast. My name is Luis Urego, and it's an honor to have you once again here with us on this episode number 17 of the podcast. We certainly thank you for stopping in and, and listening and taking a little bit of time of your day, of your busy schedule, to listen to something that could help you spiritually or grow a little bit closer uh, in your walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, my name is Luis Urego, and uh, we appreciate having you here with us. On this episode number 17, we want to continue from the last episode where we started off with our interview with Brother Benjamin Narod, who is a well-known evangelist here in the United States of this precious end time message. Uh, he currently attends Believer's Tabernacle in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, who is currently pastored by Brother Joseph Hamid. Brother Ben has and his wife have three children, three daughters to be exact, and his wife and him are very talented musicians and they currently have a a website called the narodsmusic.com where they have their first cd which is available right now for purchase and it's entitled feeling fine and they're wonderful singers so i definitely recommend uh that you uh, take a look at that if you wish to we're gonna go ahead straight uh on this episode and continue where we left off last time uh What we left off on the last episode is uh, Brother Ben uh, and I were discussing why there's a great need for the people in this hour um, within the the, within the bride, within the church um, to obtain more revelation, uh, not just head knowledge, but comprehension, which leads to a a, a revelation of the word uh, that is being preached today from behind our pulpits. I think sometimes we. We take the word and, uh, well, you know, it's just another church service. Uh, I, I fulfilled my duty for today. But we don't stop to think, what is it that God is trying to tell us? What is it? And for you to take what is being said and go look at it yourself. In other words, study the word of God. As the Bible says to study to show thyself approved. That's not just for the pastors. That's not just for the ministers. But it's also for the laity. It's also for you and me. And just quickly before we continue with the episode, I just wanted to share a message that was left to us. It's a voice message that was left to us on our 10,000 Worlds voice recorder. And it's a message from a brother named Sumi Banda. And I am assuming that he is from India because he left us a message and a, a comment on our website that said, I am a converted Christian boy from Hindu. And I have received the forgiveness through our Lord Jesus Christ. And now I want to know more and more. Thanks to your faithfully in Christ, Sumit Banda. So we want to play a quick little voice message that he left us. We thank God because God is still in the saving business. No matter what religion you're coming from, no matter what your background is, he's still in the saving business. Let's listen to what he had to say to us in the voice message. For God so loved the world that he gives his one and only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Thank you, Brother Sumit, for leaving us that voice message. And we just thank God for John 3, 16, a very well-known verse to all of us Christians and believers. But it is packed with so much truth. And we thank God for sending his only begotten son, Christ Jesus. If you would like to leave us a voice message, even just to greet us or just to leave something um, that's touched your heart or something that is meaningful to you as far as the word is concerned, please do so because we really want to hear from you. Just send uh, the voice message to the 10,000 Worlds podcast and your message could end up on a future episode of the podcast, just like the one that you just heard. So whether it's a question or a comment or or just to let us know how we're doing, we would love to make you part of this program. And it's very easy to leave us your message. Just click on the icon that's above on each of the episode posts on our website 
or you can click on our home page or on our on our website 10,000worlds.com the number 10 the letter k the word worlds.com and up on the menu bar you will see a link that says leave us a voice message it will direct you and just follow the instructions uh, there very easy and listen we want to hear from you so please use it and we will definitely make you part of this program on a future episode so we want to go ahead and continue where we left off I hope you enjoy uh, the second part of the interview and I will come back after this uh, second part with my uh, final thoughts may God bless you as you listen you know, in, in our case now, there's nothing new under the sun. I think that I think the doctrinal stuff has really been declared, the the bad and the good, for that matter. But I, I believe, as far as the people go, I still see a great need for uh, not teaching so much. I do see a need for that, but I see a need for uh, more comprehension of what they're being taught. I see the sure. people latching on to it. I believe they're beginning to really catch the truth and catch where their place is and all of this. Mm -hmm. um, I still think we have a long way to go in the message. I know this may be controversial to some of my brethren. They may disagree with me on this, but just based on my experiences, and these are mine, they can testify how they feel, but this is my way. Sure. I feel like that we have come far, but not nearly far enough. I still see people... I still have conversations. If you can imagine, I still have conversations with people who have been in the message 25 years that ask me, how do I know when I got the Holy ghost? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I'm speechless at such questions. You know, uh, uh, somebody come and asked me here just the other day, they, they made a remark about it. So when does the tribulation take place? Um, is that before the rapture after, and this individual had been in the message many years and I thought, how do you not know? How do you not know these things? And I know it can be said that this is just individuals, but it's not. It's, it's, there's a, there's a, a fairly large group of people spread out through my travels that I, I see uh, that oh. are saying these things. Oh, believe me, brother Ben, I've, I've experienced that too. You know, and these are like, for example, people that have been in the message for a long, long time and they come and they ask me these questions as well. You're yeah. thinking, my goodness, I thought maybe you would have already have gone through that, you know? Yeah, 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 but, absolutely. I do yeah. feel we're getting it. I feel like the bride is really recognizing her position. I do feel that there is, that we as ministry, we need to, I believe we're in a season of teaching. I believe mm -hmm. that instruction and how to apply the word is, is very, is very, very paramount right now. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really see a need for people establishing themselves better in what they believe because mentioning this again, this anti Branham move is basically just, it's almost like another message split only it's an anti Branham message split. These people are doing the very same things that all of the other split groups and split churches have done. They're taking a little bit of what they call truth and they're pulling a collective off to the side for themselves. And, but this particular group, they're anti Branham people, you know, well, you know, we, we see these, div these divisions and these divided groups all around the ranks of the message. And right. it's discouraging to say the least, but the results of every bit of this is it was, it was all hinged upon somebody raising up and saying, Hey, we need to understand the thunders. Hey, we need to understand the, the mercy seat or the judgment seat of Christ or what took place in 63 at the opening of the seals. Hey, does anybody understand what a white wig one means? I mean, a lot of these doctrines were birthed out of a, a, out of a genuine desire, I believe, to try to get people to understand the message and, and, sure. uh, and find their place in it. I believe we're doing that. And now that we're kind of wading through all of the muck of the doctrines and all these things that are going on, uh, I, I think we're beginning to see a clearer picture. Um, I think the, the true fivefold ministry in this message has, uh, to my opinion, has done a very good job at keeping the message pure, trying to keep the smut off of the message like Brother Bram instructed us and, and asked us to do. Right. Uh, I, I do feel like that's happening. I do feel the Lord is moving amongst the elect. 
But I also see a great moving of the church or the foolish virgin that is crying for oil, crying for something, crying and reaching out. Um, and whether a person believes they're in the message or how the message, uh, I, I, my personal opinion is I see a moving of, if not foolish virgin, at least a population of church people that are crying out for something and not getting there. And th that disturbs me because, you know, of all the preaching that's gone on in this message and everything that is archived and on YouTube and on Facebook and, and videos and, and all of the plethora of stuff that we've got today. Right. The only reason people don't understand it now, I believe, is because they're either afraid and they're scared of what they're going to get into or they just don't want to. So there's, there's, a, there's a couple populations that kind of exist within our message, and that is a group that is, uh, you know, they, they, we've got it all. This is the truth, and we don't need to move on with anything else, and yet they're stagnated in what they believe. Then we got a group that is scared to death to move forward. And then you hear you got between all of this, the little bride kind of squeezed in between all of this, that's yeah. just grabbing everything she can get a hold of to try to make it live, you know? Um, so I guess you always have a, this mixed multitude in every move of God. And in our message is no different. It's the same as Luther, the same as any of the other moves of God that we've had. Um, but I do believe the bride's getting that. I believe she is. Now, as far as the church and other folks, you know, you see a lot of division and things, but I think the elect is really getting there. I really do. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, brother Ben. Yes. Uh, I, I see it. I see it the way too. And it's not just in the United States, but, all, but it's all around the world. And yes. uh, where if, uh, if that brother, let's say in the Philippines has the Holy ghost, just like I have the Holy ghost or anybody here has the Holy ghost, the, the genuine, a genuine word birth, you know, uh, they, sh the Holy spirit should be leading them to the exact same thing Amen. that, uh, and I'm seeing that more and more, um, even with, uh, even amongst Christians that don't even uh, have all of the messages available to them, but what, with what they do have and with the Holy spirit revealing things to them, my goodness, that they, they, they preach mm. some incredible things, mm. uh, and bring out some, some really, uh, awesome things from the word. <laughs> that that uh, compared to to some of these ministers who have the full message and and, and you know and and, yes. and and it just it just it just baffles me because you know it, I think it's really the time that you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. You know? Yeah, and that's a great point because it shows us also that our source of revelation doesn't come from the mass of learning or memorizing it comes from our, our real source of revelation, which is the baptism mm -hmm. of the Holy ghost. You Amen. know, a, a person can take a handful of books and do some great things with it. Uh, with mm -hmm. a Bible in one hand and a handful of books in the other, they can do great things with it because revelation doesn't need the boundaries of the written word to be able to preach, you know, Amen. Right. and the Holy spirit can reach into things in the mind of God and pull things out that you don't even know is in the message. And I had those experiences before the computer came along. You know, back, I was young enough when I started preaching to uh, remember what it was like to preach without a computer, without having all the message available where you didn't have all the books. And I had maybe 25 books that I preached out of for several years before the computer came along. And, and I, the Lord would reveal things to me, and I'd be preaching things that when the computer did come along, I would find those exact quotes, almost verbatim statements I had made under the anointing that brother Branham said, I didn't even know he said it, you know, yeah. so that yeah. our source is the baptism of the Holy ghost. And that, that source of revelation, it, it, that's the very thing that is bringing the bride together. I do believe she is coming together under the revelation of this hour, under the open word. Uh, I just, I don't think it's as visible maybe to the world, but I think there's a purpose behind that too, brother Luis. I believe that the oh, purpose yeah. of that almost invisibility, if you will, is because, Brother Branham taught us that this that's getting ready to happen that we call the third pull will not be a public show. Absolutely. So there's some things happening under wraps that really none of us could describe or speak to or put a, put a label on it or a descriptor and say, okay, this is how we know the elect is doing dot, dot, dot. We, we just can't do that because this new thing that's happened to the elect of God called the third pull is something that's going to be a private individual affair between her and her Lord and the revelation of this message will come in such a private personal way 
that just like when the angel of the Lord told Brother Branham in the little room there in the tent vision, I'll meet you in that little room. He said, why in that little room? He said, well, don't you remember in Matthew 6 when Jesus said, when you pray, enter into your closet. And then here Brother Branham comes along and says, prayer is the key to the mysteries of God. So yeah. it, it, it proves, really, brother, I mean, the, the, the real, real bottom line of it all is it proves that, you know, this experience that we've got with the Holy Ghost, it, it is not defined by what we have learned. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's limitless, it's boundless, it's boundaryless. There's no limits that we can wrap around these things. And, and at the risk of sounding a little preachy here, you know, the, the problem I think that we have with people who fail to embrace that is because to them, boundaries and limits and definitions and labels are security blanket for their salvation. You yes. see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. they, they use yeah. those things as the Pharisees used uh, phylacteries and borders and hymns of garments and those things as, as proof that they were a genuine Israelite people in the message, I feel have done the same thing again, not to say people, I mean all of us, but there's a population that, that has done that very thing. And they use these, these limits and these boundaries and these descriptors and these terminologies and these things. Okay. This is how I know air quotes that I am a believer air quotes again, you know, it, mm -hmm. but that's not it. That's not it. It's not really, it's just really not it. Right. Yeah. You brought up some really good, interesting things there, brother Ben. Um, I feel like preaching now. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling a little religious too, brother. I hear it. <laughs> no, but it, that is the, that is the hour that we're living in. And I totally agree with you that it, it has become more and more a thing where it needs to be a personal relationship between you and Christ, not just yeah. with you, you and your church, it's not you and your pastor, it's not you yeah. and, and the entity, um, yeah. but it's, it's yeah. you and the entity of the Holy ghost, the Jesus Christ. And, uh, that's 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 the one that's the one that's going to help you continue growing in Christ. You know? Yeah. And can I say one thing here? I I want to I, I want to put this in here, too, because I think this is important in our discussion. Go ahead, brother. Ben. When we go back to, you know, speaking to salvation, just I'm not talking about the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm talking about just salvation. Mm -hmm. I think we have an issue. That needs to be addressed. I, I think it really needs to be looked at correctly. And again, I don't, I could, I wouldn't dare put a number on who, how many would do this or not do this. But when it comes to salvation, I, I had a, I had a close friend that left the message uh, three or four years ago. I forget exactly how long, but uh, his one complaint was, is you message people believe that in order to be saved, you have to know the name William Branham. Well, my answer to that was my response was, be careful who you're identifying as those that believe that, because I think, Brother Luis, I think, and, and to, to the listeners that would, would be interested in, in, in the idea of what salvation is, I, I want to submit to these that are listening. Mm -hmm. and, and in this particular discussion, I really want to highlight this next point, is that salvation is between you and Jesus Christ. Correct. Salvation can be accomplished outside of the message. Now, I'm not talking about yeah. the baptism of the Holy Ghost now. I'm talking about salvation. That's exactly right. And salvation has nothing to do with your works, what you've done, what you haven't done. To be saved, one just simply needs to recognize they're a sinner and they need a Savior. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've done, and again, when I say we, I mean just a population, but it, it's definitely been something that's ongoing so deeply in the ranks of the message that it's caused problems. I think what we've done is we have taken away from the people the ability to just simply be saved first, to just yes. meet Jesus and have an experience with the Lord Jesus and to be saved, to just experience the great, wonderful, powerful, delivering feeling and experience and understanding of what it means to be a sinner. And now no longer, I am not a sinner. I'm free from my sins. I've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ to experience that has almost become like a, well, okay, but we need to get him to the message. Yeah. I, 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 I know that. And, and, and please allow me to say publicly, 
I've spent my life declaring that. I believe that you need a a new birth according to the revelation of this day. I, I don't think we can be born again as Trinitarians or as uh, oneness people. I mean, the oneness doctrine. I don't think we can be born again under, uh, you know, I've said I'm not a Trinity and I'm not a Twinity. I don't believe in two gods either. I mean, we, we have to come together and understand that God is a person as a man, the Christ Jesus that was sent to this world, whom on the 25th of December we're supposed to honor as being the birth of our Lord Jesus. Well, I, 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 I know they try on the 25th, but I wish every day of the year people would just take some time, even message folk, and just honor the fact that this God, the Lord Jesus Christ, wants to save us. I, I mean, Holy Amen. Ghost aside, revelation aside, mysteries, terminology, depth aside, he mm -hmm. just wants to save us. And yes. as I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost on these words, I want to say to the listeners, you that are listening to this podcast, if you are struggling in your heart to know what I'm talking about, you just simply have to say to your Savior, I am a sinner, and I want you to save me, and I want you to reveal yourself to me, and then just allow him to take over. And really, friends, Brother Luis, I mean, why, why does it have to be more complicated than that? I, I've never understood. Absolutely, Brother Ben. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we're the ones who make the Christian life a complicated. Um, Jesus said, my burden is light. Yes, sir. <laughs> and we're the, ones who, we're the ones who make it heavy. <laughs> Absolutely it, right. It's just as simple as taking God at his word. Isn't Amen. it, Brother Ben? Amen. Amen. Absolutely right. And, and obeying his word, do what he said in his word as far as salvation, repent uh, of your sins, ask God for forgiveness. He's more than willing to do so, more than you even wanted. And yes, so, uh, and, and I totally agree with you, Brother Ben. Uh, if, if it, you know, there is a salvation, and of course, like as you said, that is, of course, a separate thing from the new birth because uh, the new birth has to do with the reve revelation of the word personally to you is what brother Branham said. But, uh, um, but we, if people could just, uh, sometimes preachers try to get people to be good on the outside first. <laughs> right. And then, or, or you have to understand that God sent a prophet in this day. Well, I believe, I believe, uh, um, I believe Luther had, had, had the new birth in his day or well, sure had salvation in his day. Absolutely. John Wesley for the word that they had in their day, you see? Right, right. And, 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 and they didn't know anything about Brother Branham. No, no, of course not. No, they were only required to, to come through the same channels that, that we have come through. Uh, what truth has been allotted to them, they were only required to own up to that truth. Absolutely. And I, I feel like that a lot of times when we talk about rejecting the word, People, in their minds, they feel like, well, it's, it's rejecting the message. Not all the time. Actually, mm -hmm. it's not about reject what truth. Can I say it this way? Not what truth we reject, but about rejecting truth in general. Um, somebody at a ball game could stand up and hold up a sign, St. John 316. Somebody in a motel room see it on a TV, open up their desk drawer, pull out a Gideon Bible, go to St. John 316, for God so loved the world, and scoff at it. Oh, that, what a bunch of nonsense. And without even hearing the name Brother Branham or stepping into a message church or meeting a message brother or sister or hearing a message sermon preached or a message song about Eli Eliezer or some kind of thing like that, right. they have rejected the word of God at that level. And mm -hmm. they can never go any further because of that truth that they rejected. So what we're talking about is the difference between rapturing faith and salvation. Now, if you want to go on the rapture, you've got to know the name William Branham because mm -hmm. there is no rapturing faith outside of the revelation of this message, which is the opening of those seven seals. Correct. The book of Revelation itself was the unfolding of more mysteries than just what Paul had. Paul did not have the revelation of the mystery of those seven seals. He did not have that part. We've got what Paul had plus what was in that book of Revelation. For example, Amen. if I was to sit Paul and Peter and John and these guys down and I was to say, now, Paul, you're the pattern messenger. You're the one that set the tone for us. If an angel preaches in a country, let me curse. Now, you tell me, do you understand what John wrote on the Isle of Patmos? He'd have to say, no, I could move to Peter. Peter, you got the keys. You, the Holy Ghost, used you to go to the Gentiles and so forth. Do you understand? No, I don't understand it. 
John the Revelator, John the Divine, they call him. And you say, John, you're the one who had the visions. You put them in this symbol form and wrote, this, wrote this book down like this. These letters that you got, do you understand what's in that? No, absolutely. But now ask us, ask me, ask you, ask somebody else that's got the revelation of these things. Do you understand what's going on in the book of Revelation? We can say, yes, amen. Oh, yeah, it's been revealed to us. We see it. So that's a great thing, but that book is reserved for the bride, the elect alone. Mm -hmm. Everything else outside of that is for everybody else. In other words, when we're talking about salvation, the foolish virgin are saved, but they never get the Holy Ghost. So right. if, if it's a matter of rapturing faith or salvation, then the foolish virgin are out. Because if they never come to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and receive rapturing faith and get themselves ready for the rapture, then they must be out. Well, no, because Jesus said that they would receive white robes because of the testimony that they keep and how they hold themselves and, and go through the tribulation and give their lives and all these things. Uh, the 144,000, they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But how many of the Jews down through that fifth seal, the souls under the altar that had no idea about even Jesus Christ, the Messiah, as far as revelation goes, their eyes are blinded, receive mm -hmm. white robes. They're saved. They're saved. Right. But under the truth that they had. So God is a, the Lord. Jesus is a lot more broad than what we've made. Him. Oh, and absolutely. His tent stretches a lot bigger <laughs> than what we've made him. So, I, I, I certainly agree with you. I think what we need to do as believers is we need to move forward in the divine revelation of the hour, but we should never, ever, and I strongly urge, we should never forget where we came from. Absolutely. And never, never take away good old salvation. Amen to that. Yeah. Yeah, because that's very needful. And that's a stepping stone for people to continue forward in the, yep. in the word, you know. So, I mean, in, in doing, in saying that brother Ben, let me ask you this, and I'm kind of shifting gears now to, um, to we're talking uh, a little bit regarding the, the young people. Sure. Um, uh, how is it that a young person, they, they have heard the, the, that they need the new birth all their life. And so how can you explain to them what the new birth is and, um, and, and what happens after you get the new birth? OK, um, so so <laughs> I mean, yeah, I guess you realize that the, that particular question could never be solved on this podcast alone. We would run out of time and absolutely uh, our, our RAM <laughs> and our gigabytes and everything would be exhausted by the time we got done really, really digging this, but uh, digging into this. But I, I, I will I will try to I will try to say this very, 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 very quickly and uh, not to rush through it, but to just give you a brief enough description that it won't cross any doctrinal lines and it, it would be very simply put and concerning the new birth is acts two thirty eight: repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy ghost. If a person really understands what it means to repent. Now I, I know that we have a lot of amendments that we have placed Again, when I say we, please understand, I don't mean everybody, but there is a, a, a significant population of brothers that I've heard preach through the years that when they say Acts 238, there's a, about 15 amendments that go to that. Well, you repent, but you got to see Malachi 4. You repent, but also you have to understand the Godhead. You got to repent, but you got to understand serpent seed too. Oh, and don't forget about marriage and divorce uh, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those are significant things. Well, I, 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 and one reason, one reason I was laying this in about salvation is because I think all of this is connected. If a person really desires the new birth, let's understand right now as believers and as open-minded people, open-hearted people that are wanting truth, that you cannot seek for something that God is not calling you to. Okay. Right. And if a person, and Jesus said, you know, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me and no man can call or come or approach, but what my father first calls him. It wasn't Adam crying, Lord, where art thou? It was Jehovah crying, Adam, where art thou? So we, we know, we know all those, those, those points. No man seeks God at any time. So then the question comes, well, uh, I want the Holy ghost. So uh, how can I get it? Well, then you hear preachers, they'll say, and then honest when they say it, they're just trying to help people. And they just say, 
uh, you know, uh, God wants to give it to you more than you really want. You know, well, mm-hmm. and that's wonderful. And thank God. And I'm not critical of that. I understand where they're coming from. I've used the statement myself. But that word repent is very, very, very significant if you are to understand how to get the Holy Ghost. Because mm-hmm. true repentance is likened to the sermon Brother Brennan preached about doors and a door. If I was going to parallel it with anything, I'd parallel it there. That if, you, if a man wants to, or a woman for that matter, that they want to truly repent, preacher, deacon, trust, I don't care who they are, if they really desire to be, you know, really filled with the Spirit of God and receive the gift of God, then, which we know is not tongues and it's not, not initial evidences, it's just uh, an impartation of the Spirit of God himself into your life, that, you know, within the human heart are all these little doors. So you let Jesus in, he becomes your savior, um, but yet you haven't fully repented necessarily because maybe you're not letting him have access to certain areas of your life. And so Brother Bram describes this as like an inspector years ago, and I don't know, I guess they still do it to this day, but they, they would go through a boxcar on a railroad uh, a, a train, and they go into the boxcars and they would inspect the goods to see if they were set right so they could make the journey. And then when it was, they put the seal on the outside of the door to make sure that what was on the inside would hold. Well, remember in the message future home, um, 8264. And I forget exactly. I used to know it by heart, the page number where Bram said this, but he, he, he actually tells us these words. He says that it's not when you accept the Holy ghost, but it's when the Holy ghost accepts you. And as a friend of mine told me just just uh, last year, he said, I was preaching here the other day, and he said, I was telling somebody, do you realize that if the Holy Ghost sealed you with your temper, the kind of temper that you've got, he said, do you realize that if he sealed that into you, you would have that temper throughout eternity? So mm-hmm. whatever's laying in your life that is not yet surrendered to the Lord then those elements have to be addressed before you have met the criteria, so to speak, of repentance. Repentance is not, God, I'm sorry. Repentance is, Lord, you are going to take total control of this house because I'm going to let you take total control. Um, I've been preaching a sermon uh, on, my title has been, The Fear of Being Rejected and the Joy of Being Accepted. And I went to First John chapter 2 where John speaks about um, we, we must have, so that we'll have confidence. The word confidence there means to speak without concealment. Mm-hmm. And what I think is significant there is I think that a lot of times the reason that people have not received the Holy Ghost is not that God doesn't want to give it to us, but that he sees some area of our life that we're not willing to surrender yet. And he knows that if he gives us the Holy Ghost, as my friend told me last year, a preacher friend, I thought it was a wonderful statement, that if he seals you that way, whatever condition he seals you, that's the way the boxcar is going to set. Whatever's in there, that's it. So he, he knows that either you need to yield that spot in your life or fully repent or say, God, I'm going out of the sending business. I'm going, I'm turning from sin to sin no more. And that does, we're not th- talking about mistakes and daily living now, but we're talking about a complete and total surrender to the Lord to say, okay, whatever you want to do in here, I'm not going to conceal not one part of my heart. I'm not shutting a door. I'm not closing a cupboard. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not tying off even the attic door. If you want to go in the attic space or in the basement, uh, you know, the crawl space or the hall, whatever, we're, I'm not concealing not one thing. Once a person gets there, I believe, and they're sincerely open before the Lord, then that's when full repentance has been met. And after doing so, then the Holy Spirit can look down in our soul and say, okay, now they've met the condition of my word. Now, there's another thing that goes with this. Faith, as we say, faith will bring the results. Okay, but, but remember, the confirmation of our faith is not us confirming our faith, but the Holy Ghost is confirmed by God. In other words, your faith is confirmed by God that once he sees that your faith is right and there's not one speck of doubt in your soul, that you, you don't doubt him, 
you don't have any any doubt to the word. You just trust him with all your heart, and you're just 100%, no concealment, wide open faith. Once God recognizes that, then he seals that faith with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He sends the seal as his approval for your faith. So Amen. being a personal walk and how, how a person knows that, that this is actually taking place, there's no way to describe that. And please understand, listeners out there, I, I could give you all kinds of quotes and scriptures, but at the end of the day, you alone know whether or not you're yielding yourself completely to the Lord. You know that. Your conscience declares to you those things. No preacher can define that for you. No preacher can describe that for you and say, okay, well, you're not because of this. I could say that, but I might be wrong. The truth of the matter is, is that God give us a conscience in our human spirit so that we could identify our, our feeling before the Lord in these matters. And, and if our heart condemns us in any way at all, that there's something not right. Uh, I remember a preacher telling a story about when he was seeking for the Holy Ghost years ago, when he was a boy, he stole a candy bar from a store that he, he had, he still frequented it actually. And uh, he, he said that candy, gar- that candy bar, uh, pardon me, excuse me. I mean to say the, uh, the candy bar rather, I'm trying uh, trying to say 12 things at once. I'm getting excited, but, uh, <laughs> but uh uh, and sitting in front of this Baskin Robbins, I hear it doesn't help talking about sweets and everything, but uh, oh, Duck and Duck on my right, Russell Stover next to it. So I'm kind of in a chocolate world right here. <laughs> and a little well, but, uh, but, but anyways, uh, he said that candy, go, candy bar got to be as big as a car <laughs> before. And said, so it finally just stood up and I went back to the owner and I laid money on the, on the counter. And I said, I'm, I'm brother so-and-so and I'm trying to, trying to get my life right with God. And years ago I stole a candy bar from your store and I wanted to repent for it. And mm. said that once he slid the money over, the man started weeping and, and he slid the money back. And he said, if, if he said, you're seeking for God to forgive you. And he said, yes, that's right. He said, well, the Bible said, he said, I'm a Christian too. And the Bible said that you lay your gift at the altar and reconcile with your brother. And once that is forgiven, then you can go back and your heavenly father will forgive you. And he took the boy, uh, the man, he was, uh, I guess, a teenager at the time. He took him by the hand and he said, because I am forgiving you for this candy bar. Now you go back and let your heavenly father forgive you. And he went back and prayed and received the Holy Ghost right after that, that experience. Wow. So it goes to prove, I think, that, that this baptism that we speak of, this experience we have with God, it is something that personal. You know in your heart whether or not you're a believer, whether you really truly believe it. And I don't mean doubts and frustrations and things that come with human nature. I mean, in your heart of hearts, something deep in you that speaks underneath everything else, all the other things, but, but not. And that one silent voice inside of you that uh, when you put your head on your pillow of the night, that's the voice that talks to you. You know, you're not right. You know this, you know that. And I think God doesn't play games with us, Brother Luis. I think that, I think it's important to, to really understand that the Holy Ghost is determined to help us. I don't think right. the Lord just plays a hide and seek game. Um, oh, if you want to, if you want to receive the Holy Ghost, you're going to have to figure it out. No, I, I, I don't think the Lord operates that way. I think he tries to make this as easy for us as he can. So, and I'm saying as he can, I'm talking about the creator now, he can do anything he wants to do. But in our way of thinking of it, he makes it very simple for us so that we can figure all this out. It's not difficult if we'll just try to be sensitive to this moving of the Spirit of God. Now, after a person receives the Holy Ghost, it's an experience that you cannot label, you cannot define it, you cannot describe it. It's something that, like, as I was using the other night, preaching a uh, little, little church about, uh, about the Holy Ghost, and I asked all the sisters in the church to stand up, and I've done this several places, and I'd say, now, you women in here that have had a baby, you stand up. And so they'd stand to their feet, and I would, I would kind of jest with them a little bit, uh, you know, not making jokes so much, but just kind of trying to make a point. I'd say, now, you didn't have a baby. You know? And one sister just the other night, when I pointed at her and said, you didn't have a baby, she's holding the baby in her arms and she kind of held the baby up a little bit. And, and, and I go ahead, well, but then look right here, you know? So, <laughs> I, I mean, it, it's one of those experiences that nobody could talk you out of it because you were there. It happened. You know, it happened just like mm-hmm. with me. I couldn't label it. I couldn't describe it, but I knew it took place. 
I think the Holy Ghost operates that way, and it's meant to be that way, so nobody can tamper with that. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. tamper-proof in the fact that whatever experience you had that way with God, it is such a personal, intimate thing between you and the Lord. Nobody can, can fool with that, and that's appropriate. That's the way it should be. So after you receive the Holy Ghost, it should be that positive to you. I mean, 20 years should not go by, and you're still wondering. 10 minutes shouldn't go by, and you're still wondering. You'll have moments where you say, well, maybe I didn't. Maybe I did. Maybe You'll have those moments, but you'll always be anchored from that point. Now, now comes the next part of your question, which is how do you know afterwards? Well, that to me is easier than this first part because the after part is simply you watch your nature and what it is that you desire after. And you watch those things change in you. Um, Brother Ram made a statement when rising of the sun, you know, how do you know you've been quickened? He said, your soul changed, didn't it? And that's true. Mm -hmm. Your desire, mm -hmm. changed, your soul changed, your everything that you wanted is now different and your wants are even different. Greater than that, there's something in you that has the ability to stick with the word. If it hurts you, if it offends you, if it burns your hide, as we say down here in the South. If it, if it, whatever it does, whatever the word does, there's something in you that grabs a hold of that and says, amen, amen. Don't understand it. Not even sure how it applies, but right. And I believe it. And quite amen. honestly, that is an experience in itself that happens even when sometimes you disagree. I had, I, I remember, I remember when I was a young Christian, I could not understand Matthew 28, 19 and Acts 2, 38. And I remember arguing with my parents. I'd already been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I knew that was right. But I'd say, they're contradictory one to another. He's saying titles over here, and then he's saying name over here. And, and I, mind you, I had a Holy Ghost, but I didn't understand that part of baptism. And one day I was just sitting there with my Bible open. And I read through Matthew 28, 19, and I flipped over and read Acts 2, 3. And I said, well, Lord, all I know is this is your word. And somehow or another, it's got to be right. I just don't understand it. And do you know, brother, I flipped it back over to Matthew 28, 19, and that word name, N-A-M-E, looked like it was 20 foot long <laughs> and four <laughs> stories tall, and it just it just popped out at me. And so yeah. that's what I'm saying is that it's not, it's not a mental thing. It's not an intellectual reconciliation. It, it's something that inside of you, you immediately gravitate to the word because your gravitational pull is to the word. Right. Okay. And that, that's one way you know. It's the most essential way you know that you've got the Holy Ghost. Another way the Bible said is that you love your brother. Eternal life is living for the man that would kill you. When you mm. get there, you're standing in the vestibule of heaven. You are looking heaven in the face. When you can live for the man that would kill you. So no. it, that's a pretty powerful thing. Um, do you mind if I share a testimony on that part? Yeah, go ahead, brother. Yeah. Um, I, I told you about the I told you about the hate and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a boy that I'd I'd been fighting with, fist fighting, like you know, physically at it before I got saved. And I got saved in between my eighth and ninth grade year. I received the Holy Ghost right before becoming a freshman in high school. And I used to get in fist fights with this kid. And uh, when I received the Holy Ghost, just a few weeks into school. Um, we was in the gymnasium and, and he come up behind me, and pushed me down, fell and hit my knee. And man, I jumped up and I was going to, I was going to wail. I mean, whether I got beat up or not, I didn't care. I was going to go after him. And all of a sudden I felt something swirl inside of my heart, like right where my heart was at, like a swirl feeling. And I felt grief come over me and I just bowed my head quickly. And I said, Oh Lord, I'm so sorry. I, I don't want to do that. Now, now, brother, I'm testifying before this audience to say nobody taught me that. Nobody instructed me to behave that way. But Brother Brennan made a statement that's significant. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm using these remarks to answer these the, the, to the question that we're, we're addressing. And, uh, and that is the question of how. I think it's significant to understand that Brother Bram said, when you receive the Holy Ghost, it swings this body subject to the word. Nobody oh, right. taught me not to fight. That was just something I did. That's one reason I was bullied is because I'd, 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 
they saw me as somebody that they could pick on. And I, I egged them on just as much as they egged me on probably. And, you know, and, and, uh, it was just, it was just one of those things, but, it, but anyhow, I, I don't, I certainly don't glorify any of that or glory in it. It was just, it was just part of my history. And, and, uh, and I had no feeling in my heart if I would have gotten a fight with somebody, if I could ever overpower them, which I never considered myself to be tough, but if I could ever overpower them, I probably would just continue doing whatever I had to do without any remorse. But once I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden there's this new thing happening to me where I really don't want to do that. I don't want to hit this kid. I don't want to hurt this person. Mm-hmm. I don't want to fight him back. Now, where did that come from? Well, I mean, I could give you 10 quotes, but what good does that do if you've never had that experience? That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> It has to do. It has ties down with that with an experience with God. Yes, sir. It goes back. It just goes back to that. And you know, brother Ben, uh, it's interesting that you also mentioned that some we can't really explain sometimes this this new birth. That's right. Um, it's something that uh, you know Jesus when he was talking to Nicodemus, and he was telling him about the new birth. Well, we know that he couldn't get the new birth because even at that moment, just because Jesus still had to die and resurrect, but yet he was telling him about it and planting that seed, that word, you know, there. And, right. and, and then he tells him, he, I like what he says there at the end of that scripture. He, he tells him, he says, you know, the wind blows, but you don't know where it cometh or where it goeth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, and th- that's, uh, that's everyone that is birth uh, that is, that is, you know, born again Beautiful. is what Jesus uh-huh. says. Beautiful. I never, yeah. I never, I never understood that verse. And then one day I was studying it. I was looking into that and I'm like, you know what? I bet you that's what the Lord was talking about. It's a, it's <laughs> right. an experience that, that you can't really explain. Just like you can't really sometimes explain that where the, where the wind is, is blowing, you know, where it cometh or where it, or it goes, but you know that it's there because you feel the effects of it. That's see? right. That's right. Or you see, or you see the effects of it, you know? in your life and so the effects of the new birth or the holy ghost in your life is that your life is changing that's right that's yeah, exactly that's right. right and i think as we grow in christ i think we begin to see more of that uh, happening mm-hmm. but but you know i i want to remind everybody too especially you that have been born again by the holy ghost and you've been served the lord for a number of years uh, ever how long the hardest person to see christ in is in yourself yeah yeah, <laughs> you know that's the that's the toughest place. I can see it in all kinds of people, but to see it in me, that's that's hard sometimes because you know you, and and you know for all the listeners, you know you young people and all, you know you better than anybody. And, and I think a, a a primary issue is I spent some time on the field, uh, preach. I was in uh, Trinidad was one place that comes to mind having some meetings there and. I, I was preaching on the love of God. And there was a, there was a young man that come to me after church and he said, and he said, Oh, that was so good about the love of God. And then, then as soon as he shook my hand and stepped away, there was this older brother that, I mean, he was, he was, a, he was a preacher he, and he'd been in the message a long time and I knew him. And he said, I have never really understood God that way. And hmm. the crux of what it was is that sometimes we identify God we blend him together with the abusive father or the mean uncle or the, the dictator type mama, or we blend him with the school teacher that was mean or some boss that's been a dictator. You know, we, we blend God as to being the same type of man. And we think that he's at ready to throw us into hell just to the first mistake we make. The truth of the matter is, is that the love of God is so, you know, he, he, he only corrects us as a, as a friend of mine said some time ago, we were talking about this and, and he said, brother Ben, he said, I, I instructed somebody just the other day to realize that the only time God really corrects us is when he has to. And I thought that was profound because as a father of my three beautiful daughters, I, I love them dearly with all of my heart. I hate correcting them, but when I do correct them, it is because their behavior has demanded of me that I must correct them. And I feel like it's the same way with the Lord. And when it comes to the issue of receiving the Holy Ghost and having these experiences, I think that holds us back some because we feel like we're having to obey a rule from a ruler. We have to line up with a sergeant in arms, you know, the chief of the 
of, of the of the tribe and and you know so it, it's not really so much a love affair and allowing somebody to rescue us from a world of sin and a life of sin and a, and a life of hurt but it's mm-hmm. more of a i've got to reform myself like joining the military so i can make something out of myself you know and that's not really what it's all about and and the lord jesus is not standing there with a rod of iron in his hand waiting to you know whack us in the head and send us to hell the first his grace is very very a uh, a patient long suffering i mean the scripture talks about how that the husbandman waited long long suffering long patience waiting 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 for us to bring forth fruit early and latter rain so not just in the early stages of our walk with God, but he's patient throughout all of it. Uh, one place Brother Bram described it as a father holding a child as a, the child stumbles, falls down, reaches and picks him by the hand, raises him up. Come on, try it again. That's the way the Lord does us. I, I really Amen. feel like we almost have this mentality that God is such a judge that every little mistake we make that he's ready to get us. And it's just not that way. I think the Lord knows we're human. I think he knows that because he created humans. He created us with all of our little strains and who's a ma what's and, and what's a ma jigs and all the little things in our life, the strains and the widgets and the wadgets that we were, you know, born with and, and mm-hmm. grab bag of our life. And I really believe that God understands that your great, great, great grandfather had a horrible temper and you've got 10 times what they had. I think your great great grandmother might have been a flapper and she her great great might have been a chorus girl. I think he understands if you're a rock and roll sp- strip tease and I think he still knows how to take care of all those problems. And right. it, his love extends to us in a manner that it, it's not a judgmental thing but it is a here I can fix this if you'll let me fix it. There you have part two of my interview with Brother Ben Narod. I trust that you received something or some nugget that would help you in your walk with our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we think that God is just, as Brother Ben said, ready to just strike us with a lightning bolt as soon as we do something wrong. And in reality, if you think about it, he would not have sent his only begotten son He would not have come down himself to die for you, to pay the penalty for you of hell that you and I deserved in order for you to be saved, in order for you to be forgiven of your sins and do all of that so that he can at the end strike you with lightning bolts and punish you. I think that is the tactic of the devil and the devil always wants to have the believer or the Christian constantly under condemnation because when he knows that you are condemned think about it when you feel condemned and when you feel unjustified when you feel down depressed it's hard to continue the christian walk it's hard to walk in the ways of the lord but when you have all of that lifted up from you and you take the word of god where it says now there is no condemnation to them that believe, to them that are in Christ Jesus. When you take the word of God in that way, then there is no condemnation. Those condemnations that Satan tries to bring to you in your life is nothing but lies. And we know that Satan is a liar from the beginning. Every time he opens his mouth, it's only to say a lie. It's never to tell the truth. I like what Brother Ben says, and I believe he said it in the last episode, is that How can Satan tell you that you don't have the Holy Ghost when he's never experienced it himself? How can he tell you something that he doesn't have? That you don't have something that he doesn't have himself, you see? So everything that is contrary to the word of God, cast it down. It's reasoning, it's lies. But everything that draws you closer to walk closer to him and that draws you closer to the word and that leads to a perfect relationship with Christ to more revelation in your life then it's got to be from God because that's what God wants for you he wants it it's just as bad as you and I want it but of course as James chapter 4 says if we draw closer to God then he will draw 
nigh unto you. Draw nigh unto him, and he will draw nigh unto you. Brother Branham said he's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman, and he can do nothing more than what you allow him to do in your life. I hope that you enjoyed this part two of this interview. Come back again on the next episode where we finish off our interview with Brother Ben Narod, which will be part three of the interview. May God richly bless you the rest of this week. And listen, I wish you all a happy uh, holiday season wherever you are at. Christmas is being celebrated all around the world. But I wish you a wonderful and restful Christmas time with your family with friends, loved ones, and uh, most and foremost, remember the reason for the season. And the reason for the season is Christ Jesus. May God bless you as you enjoy the rest of your week. And remember, everything that you do this week, don't neglect your soul. Because remember, your soul is worth 10,000 worlds. So do everything you can to feed that soul. May God bless you. Until the next episode, I'll talk to you later. God bless you.